Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. This is Peter Hawley, Teaching in the Arts is my podcast. Thank you for coming back. A little something different today, we'll call it uh, working in the arts, performing in the arts. Uh, what I've done is gone back and, and looked at a bunch of the interviews we've done so far, and I've pulled clips from six of them. And it's all working artists and teachers and some students uh, talking about what they do for work. And uh, then I'm going to give you a little update. But before that, uh, the little lesson of the day here. Um, last week, in last week's episode, uh, near the end of it, you may have heard Joe Pollock mention working with uh, me and, and my partner, Jim Feaster. So I want to take a, a moment to talk about Jim. Uh, Jim's birthday would have been this coming week, uh, spring, uh, April 20th, so um, Earth Day. And uh, Jim died five years ago, five years ago, right about now. And Jim and I were business partners for a long time. Let's call it 20 years. It may have been 18. It may have been 21. I, I don't know. I'm not doing the math. But um, the reason I feel I can talk about Jim here is um, I don't want to say happy birthday, but um, he, he was a mentor to me, and he also was a, was a teacher. I, I, when I taught at Columbia College in downtown Chicago, I was able to bring him in as an adjunct, and he taught a couple of classes there. And then when I went away to uh, Tribeca, I brought him in and he taught there. And, and students really loved him. And actually, after he died, a couple of students did a really nice Facebook uh, tribute to him. But he, more than that, he was a mentor to other teachers there. I certainly know Tremaine, Tremaine uh, Williams, uh, who listens to this podcast, uh, looked at Jim as a, as a mentor, as a teacher. Vedran uh, Reza Debegovic uh, also did the same. And I still run into a lot of teachers who still talk about Jim. But one of the things I really liked about about working with Jim was, you know, he was maybe 17 years older than I was. And, and he... Um, he, he, he showed me the ropes. You know, we were doing directing a lot of TV commercials back then. And for the first couple of years, we'd go to a production meeting at the ad agency. And even though I was the director and he was often the, the cinematographer and we sort of produced together, those first few meetings, he didn't let me talk. He, he made me uh, sit and watch and observe as we went around the room and listen to the creative director and all that kind of stuff. And it was driving me crazy. But he was right because I would have just spoken up and said what was on my mind as opposed to doing uh, the right thing and the political thing. And uh, we just had a great time and a great experience. And, and this time of year, because it's his birthday and it's kind of around the same time when he died, I always think about Jim. And I was so glad to hear Joe talk about him last week. And, and I'm sure over these episodes, we'll talk more about him, like uh, the time we uh, budgeted uh, for a TV commercial, national TV commercial from a pub in England, uh, when we had gotten the phone call and pulled out a legal pad and, and put together a budget and sure enough, got the job and flew back to Chicago and, and shot it a week later. Anyway, that's the lesson for the day. Today, as I said earlier, uh, it's going to be uh, working in the arts. So uh, we've got six um, uh, clips from previous episodes, and, and we're going to start it off with Julie Hill talking about uh, her project, and we're going to follow that up with uh, Erica Bank and Sid Gupta from Northwestern talking about the night school project, and we're going to end up this first half of the show with Danya Khan from the Harold Ramis Film School in Second City. And here is my conversation with those three right now. I've asked everyone who sits over there the same question: What are you working on now? Because you, I don't think you. What informs you as a as a uh, teacher is your work, and as your work and goes back and forth and back and forth. You know, you, what you learn in the field, you bring back to the classroom, and what you do in the classroom, you you learn. You know, it goes back and forth. What are you working on? I know you have to get out here to go do something, but you know, I um, you know, I'm. I'm just back from Ohio, so I'm in Chicago and kind of re-upping the uh, the freelance world. I'm writing for a place called Bold Blog, which is um, backed by the Jacobs Foundation, which looks at early brain development and learning. Mm -hmm. So um, working on a story about tackle football and um, its impact on young brains. Mm -hmm. Boy, there was a, a guy for the Patriots yesterday in the Super Bowl got cold cocked uh, bad. Well, can badly. you imagine that at six years old? Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's some recent studies showing that uh, early hits and the earlier you start playing tackle football, the more likely mm -hmm. you are to have behavior mm -hmm. problems. And so there's actually three states in the past week have proposed laws against under 12 year old tackle football. That's smart. And um, along with that, um, I work for various universities around town doing media and stories on their good works and research. One of the things you've told me 
that I tell students, I bet I've told my students in this semester, I'm only three weeks into this semester, you told it to me once we were having coffee or something and and you were doing something for WBZ, which is the NPR affiliate here in Chicago. And you said to me, and it was an eye opener, but it's the thing I share, you had to take a picture and you had to write copy. And I'm like, this is radio. <laughs> you know? right. Not anymore. Not you know? anymore. You have to be nimble yeah. and dexterous and deft like like Dr. Seuss says, right? <laughs> um, you have to. It's not even a choice. Um, I, you know, That's part of the reason that I started taking still pictures a couple of years ago is to be able to take pictures for, for those assignments. Being for, able to take pictures for the radio. <laughs> for the radio, right? Yeah. Because, you know, it's such a visual medium. But, uh, you know... <laughs> Everybody's got a website, and you're mm -hmm. not just going to post a SoundCloud mm -hmm. little graph, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. You still have to write the headline. Right. It's still all about writing. You know, that was a little bit of a shock for my OU yeah. kids that were media students, most of them male, most of them wanting to to shoot, that they're still going to have to write. write. They're going to have to write proposals. They're going to have to stand up and pick for money yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to the old Worldwide Square yeah. Foundation. Yeah. <laughs> I have, I have another bad pun mm -hmm. that um, <clears throat> they all wrote me thank you notes when I left OU. And Sweet. I got all teary and I had a city Poitier moment. It was kind of my two skirt with love. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was really quite moving and uh, they were just adorable. I... It was, a, it was a special class, I think, for a variety of reasons because I was one of them and, like, I, can tr I could translate... Uh, <laughs> I could translate Cleveland. So tell us all about the Night School Project, and, and I have not said much about it at all on, on this air. Right. Okay, so basically, um, when I came to Northwestern as a freshman, I was looking on the club register, trying to find a club um, that would kind of combine my academic interests and my music interests. And I came across Night School Productions. Um, it was listed as a music video production group along with music management, which struck me as truly fascinating. Um, and I tried my best to get involved. I reached out to all of the listed people, and I found out that the club was no longer um, active at the time. So just because I had been talking to so many people and my name was kind of thrown out there, over the summer I was approached by a professor who was like, I really want to bring night school back. Um, it's existed since the 80s. There's such a strong legacy. They brought so many great things to the table. Do, would you be interested or do you know someone that's interested in kind of leading the reboot of night school? And I jumped at the <laughs> opportunity. I was absolutely ecstatic um, to be allowed the opportunity to not only get involved with a, this group, but to help lead this group and to help revive its very strong legacy. Um, so like I said, the group was primarily, I mean, you can speak better about this mm -hmm. than me, um, a music video production group. And um, my specific interests don't really resonate with um, production. I mean, now they've kind of developed into that. But <laughs> um, so I was trying to see how I can kind of adjust the club to meet more of my interest in music business and the music industry, um, which is how I kind of thought of the idea of One Takes. Um, so One Takes is essentially a live concert series that focuses on producing high quality audio and visual of musicians um, in a casual setting. So the idea kind of um, derived from NPR's Tiny Desk Concerts, um, where they produce these really, really high quality quality audio and video of musicians in the actual NPR office, mm -hmm. um, which is just super neat. So my concept was to kind of translate that idea into the Northwestern scope. And honestly, the the talent um, on both the musician and the production side that is available at Northwestern. So these are all students, you know, all student musicians mm -hmm. uh, doing original compositions, original music? You yeah. Know, for now. Yeah, yeah, for now. We're starting off with just um, Northwestern students, but uh -huh. hopefully we want to transform Night School One Takes beyond the Northwestern scope and making it not only a renowned Northwestern production group, but also one of a greater entity. Sure, sure. But I mean, but it's original music. It's not like they're doing mm -hmm. covers or anything like that. It's Northwestern students playing music, their own original music, and Northwestern students recording, filming it, and editing it. So it's all student-based Right. Original content. Yeah. Well, we actually had an acapella group featured in one of our episodes this past uh, winter, and they 
uh, did some covers just because that's usually what acapella groups sure. end up doing. Yeah. Um, I saw the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we'll, we'll have links to all this uh, on the website mm-hmm. and, and we'll, we'll let people know how to see it. I've saw sure. the first one you did this year and I think yeah. it's great. So, 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 so Sid, what is your role in this? You're part of night school as well. Yes. Yeah, so, um, again, like before coming to college, I was looking at clubs to join. So the two clubs that I really liked were night school and A&O. A and O, yeah. Yeah. So, what, what is which is what's that A and O stand for? I don't remember. It's a secret. They never, <laughs> they never tell people. <laughs> is, that, is that true? Yeah. It's like Armadillo Day. You know, it's Basically, like the exactly. Armadillo is. Yeah. Yeah, but um, so I came, I I I came to Northwestern, but night school wasn't there anymore. So I got involved with A and O. I started producing for A and O. I produced a show with them. I was like doing student films and stuff, till um, our VP. Our ex VP, he approached me and he asked me like if I wanted to be head of production for night school, and I jumped at the opportunity wow. as well. And, so and what does that mean? What does head of production mean? Because when we were doing it, now I'll go backwards in time in a little bit. When we were doing it, we were just producer, director, editor. You know, there was no head of production. Mm-hmm. You know, what what was head of? Production? So the thing is that now that we're functioning as a group, we have other. Um, sort of wings in the within night school so we have like an in our committee that looks for more artists wow. and then we have a business operations committee which handles our all all this uh, all the things with sofo and like the fundraising and everything sofo what yeah. mm-hmm. student organizations of financial office oh, wow they're the yeah. administration uh-huh. and then we have a marketing committee uh, who who works on the marketing and productions is basically so that that comes under me like director so we work on finding the crews for the videos and mm-hmm. then we shoot it so tell us about undercover <laughs> I will and, fill you and, guys in yes and what you want to do sure so undercover is a short film that's kind of based on an experience i had growing up um, about a young Muslim girl wanting to join a gospel choir. So like I said, I was big in musical theater, <laughs> love singing, still love singing. Um, so it's a story based on that idea and um, how she has to like sneak out to join the choir and um, it's a huge play on like gospel robes and like Muslim attire as well. And that's where the title comes into play. Um, and this project has been something I've been working on for almost a year. We're looking to finally shoot it first week of April, so mm. coming up soon. Um, How long is the script? The script is about 10, 10 to 12 pages, uh-huh. roughly. Yeah. And, Still being edited. And, 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 and are, are you working with um, what kind of budget do you have and how are you shooting so it? So we did stuff? an Indiegogo mm, and good. we raised money. Uh, we raised 5000 to do it, which is like a ton of money yeah. for a short film, which is great. Um I've completely like redone my apartment to look like a home. So, mm-hmm. and that's been such a cool thing to try and do is how do you make something so familiar to yourself, filmic and mm-hmm. stylized? Mm-hmm. That's been such a fun You're project. doing it all yourself. You're not using a production totally designer or myself, a director. myself. Yeah, uh-huh. painting. My sister, again, is an architect. And so um, she has a huge design background. So she's been helping. Uh, my dream in life is to have a production company with my sister. Oh, sweet. Um, Kind of like a Cohen Brothers, but a Con Sisters, you know, like a little cute brown Muslim <laughs> yeah, yeah, version yeah. <laughs> to, to the Jewish Cohen Brothers. Um, so we've been working, and this will be our first like big production as the Con Sisters. So wow, that's, a, that's great. She's here local, also. She's not. She's oh. in Houston, so she's working remotely. She's oh. come down or up to Chicago a few times, um, and we'll be here for the production as well. So you want you want to shoot in six weeks or so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, are you gonna? So the trailer was completely separate, and you're right. recasting the mom there, but you're keeping right. the girls. Yes. Okay. Yeah. How many? What's the total cast? The total cast. Well, we have a gospel choir, so we're looking at about like a twenty person cast. Wow. Um, and all the st- everybody who's working on it, um, has been someone that's been per- like I've met at Second City or mm-hmm. has, you know, come from that yeah. little group. So your DP and right, editor ev- and stuff. Yeah. Right. Everyone. Yeah. Well, a, a few of them weren't students there, but they're people I've met through students there. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how that came into fruition. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's still, I still have so much to figure out. Sure. It's ruining my life, Peter. <laughs> how, 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 how can I help? I, I ask students that all the time. How can sure, I help? What yeah. Can I, do? I need yeah. locations. I need actors. No, um, we're figuring it out slowly, yeah. but surely. Do you have a producer? 
I do. I'm the producer on it, which is the yeah, worst. Well, and my advice would be get bring producer. someone else. Yeah, because yeah, yeah because the the writer director in you is going to fight the producer in you, right. and someone's going to lose. Right. Absolutely. So just someone who you know, it's not like get necessarily giving them the checkbook, mm-hmm. but you know, here, here's. I would a, love to. Yeah. I would. <laughs> I'm so willing to just hand over the money to someone else and be like, I'll be there on the day to shoot. We're all good. Produ- like producing is possibly the bane of my existence. What do you have an assistant director? I do have an assistant okay. director. Maybe maybe you could bump that person right. up a little yeah. bit. Just just because what's going to happen is at some point, um, you you as writer director are going to be working and really into the scene you're doing, and at some point it's going to be lunch, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and they're going to sit there and say, well, you know, Danya, we got to break for lunch, and you don't want to, and mm-hmm. if you're the one person who says I have to break for lunch and I want to keep going, right. it's you know, too much. it's too much. It's absolutely, too and much. then just other decisions. You know, you you just can't be objective Absolutely. about it. So I it's, strongly it's... encourage you to find someone. So that was great. That was uh, Julie Hill, Erica Bank, and Sid uh, Gupta from Northwestern, and, um, and and Danya Khan from from Harold Ramis. So just a quick little update. I, I talked to all of these folks earlier today. Uh, Julie Hill is working on that uh, ABA Journal article on if youth football should be and how they could regulate it. That's going to come out in May or June, she tells me. Eric and Sid and the Night School Project, they've got three episodes in the can, and they're filming two more this weekend, which actually is yesterday (laughs) when you hear this, and uh, two more coming up after that, and they're working hard on getting the music portion of the Night School Project onto SoundCloud and Apple Music and other places like that. And Danya Khan just uh, last week finished shooting her film, and that's in post-production, so good luck to all of you guys. And now uh, part two of the show, uh, more interviews with uh, teachers in the arts who are working in the arts. So first up is, is Brian Cagle. Uh, followed by Brad Giori and Bill Bacon. And I will be back after all of that, and we'll we'll get an update on them. I want to talk about the the Thompson film. Oh, yeah. And uh, tell us about it. Okay, so... The uh, Thompson Center film, I should say. Yeah, the... uh... There's a documentary I shot um, for uh, director Nate Nate Eddy. It's called uh, Starship Chicago. You were were the DP? Yes. Uh And... uh, and, and and a couple of former students also uh-huh. worked on it. Work, good. Uh, um, but the uh, the documentary is about the Thompson Center downtown, mm-hmm. which is, you know, where Clark and Lake stop. It's the only place where all the trains come together, but it's this spaceship-looking mm-hmm. building. Helmut Jan. Uh, Helmut Jan yeah. uh, is the, the architect uh, and really someone who is like this legendary architect in the city. And, uh, it's an infamous building if you yes. live in the sh- Chicago. Oh, I my mean, gosh. People it, either – Helmut Jan, for those of you who don't know, also did the uh, Marina Towers, right? Oh, no. No, no. That's, no, that's – oh, gosh. Yeah. I blew that one. But we did – well, actually, <laughs> I, I met him because we uh, – I worked on a documentary with him previously when they were tearing down Goldberg's Prentice Women's Hospital. Oh, right. And so oh, – right. That funky building. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right, yeah right. Which also yeah. – crazy looking building. And so I had heard that they were going to tear – well, now Browner was talking about selling the Thompson Center mm-hmm. two years ago, three years ago. And um, and I immediately called the director up and I knew it was like his favorite building in the city and said, okay, I think they're wanting to tear down your building. And and so we immediately he said, okay, we're shooting this this summer. So we got together and, um, and you know, interviewed uh, just these l- – luminaries uh, uh, in both Chicago architecture as well as like, you know, architectural critics in, in the city um, about the debate. And it really is a debate because, you know, as you said, it's, it's an infamous building. People that work there often hate it, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and yet it wasn't built to specs as originally in design. Mm. But the goal is, well, if, if the goal is to fix it up to where what it should have been, is the government really going to be the state government really the one best to do this? But if we sell it to somebody, are they going to tear it down? So at any rate, we made this um, documentary about the the Thompson Center, which I feel like when you walk in there, it feels like it feels like Blade Runner. You know, I, <laughs> I tell people it feels like Blade Runner since it feels like an '80s version of uh-huh. the future. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, yeah. and I, and I love it for that. And yet, um, and you know, I'd always wanted to have a good excuse to go in there and just Play, shoot right. for everything, you know. And um, but yeah, so we made this film. Uh, it took about a year to wrap uh, editing and all the final interviews up and everything. We got to interview Big Jim Thompson, governor, former hmm. governor who's named after and whatnot, and get all these different opinions. And um, and released it online and um, and immediately started getting picked up by, you know, uh, various, you know, 
Chicago Tribune wrote about it. LA Times. LA Times. Yeah. Architectural Digest actually cool. did something online. Huh. And, uh, and Can people see it? Yeah, yeah. It's on Vimeo, uh, Starship Chicago. Um, it's available there. And there's um, we'll be doing another screening uh, in the city in a couple of weeks, although cool. I don't have the information on where that's right. at yet. Well, but, let uh, me know and I'll post it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the other thing that we've got to talk about is Mind on Heaven. Okay, yeah. All right, so so tell us what that is. Ah, so I thought I'd put theater in the background of <laughs> my life, but yeah, one of my one of my great friends um, and close collaborators worked on my first film. Uh, ben Williams is an actor I've known forever. He's also from UTC, from Chattanooga. Um and he lives in New York and works with a company there called Elevated Repair Service. And he's been with them for like 10 years. Um, and they do all this crazy stuff like eight-hour, very word-for-word Great Gatsby. Sure. I, I remember when that was uh, huh. and, uh And so anyway, he's been working doing the experimental theater that, that you know, I had tried to talk him out of many years <laughs> ago. And um, anyway, we had a close friend of ours that was very influential from Chattanooga um, who died. Who? Dennis Palmer. Uh and uh, Dennis Palmer was this um, sort of he was he was musician artist uh, kind of a polymath though because he was really good at you know bird calls and <laughs> really you know we loved you know talking philosophy and whatnot but he was someone who uh, who with uh, along with um, uh, this this other recording uh, partner Bob Stagner they created the Shake and Relieve Eye Society which is a nonprofit there that brought again strange art music stuff when I was there uh, hmm. and. And when I moved back there, I was briefly like I was on the board of directors. I was working to help bring in um, music that wouldn't otherwise come in. You know, we brought in the Tibetan monks to do one of the sand paintings and everything. Uh, but anyway, uh, Dennis had died. Uh, he'd known he had a heart attack and he knew he wasn't long on this earth, but it all kind of took us by surprise. He was only, oh gosh, 50, hey. not quite 56. Hey. And um, yeah, so. At any rate, we uh, we did like a, we got together to do kind of a tribute of things that we thought would be he think were really funny on stuff that he had turned us on to, uh, strange ephemera of you know southern you know TV and 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 whatnot, um, and we did this thing at his memorial. Uh, you know, he flew in, I flew in, we do this thing real quick, and it just fell really flat. <laughs> and we were like, well, this is really fun, though. <laughs> <laughs> no one likes it, but yeah. we do. <laughs> yeah. And, but we really, like, what is a tribute? You know, we try to figure out how to make a tribute to uh, uh, someone who, you know, you really care about and you want people to know about. He's this incredible artist that you don't know about, but how do we tell you about that since you don't know about him? So you realize that then the tribute also always comes back around to you, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we began to meet on a regular basis and develop this show called Mind on Heaven that is, it begins really, and ends really, as a tribute to Dennis Palmer, but it goes a lot of places in between, you know? And I think it kind of matches his sort of surreal uh, energy as well, you know? So we try, try to both invoke him without doing a more like a biographical mm -hmm. uh, piece. It's really also about growing up as a, as a, you know, as an artist in the South, and mm -hmm. where do you where do you go with that? <laughs> what so, do you do with that? So it, it played in Chicago. Yeah, well, we, yeah, we did a development show at the uh, the Gray Center at the University of Chicago uh, in 2014, and then gradually we started you know picking up uh, you know time to do it here and there, and uh, we did a couple of workshop performances in New York, and that led to um, like a three week run at Axis Theater uh, this last September. Yes, right. and really well reviewed. And where's yeah. the future of this show? Uh, we're hoping that we go to Detroit uh, uh, in the coming year. Uh, we're talking to folks there about bringing the show there, as well as uh, a couple other cities. We we hope to tour it. You know, it would be nice to be able to tour this in a way that we can go in and out for you know a week at a time. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I you know, I never thought I was gonna. Go back to theater. Be on stage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, crazy, I mean, crazy. I'll post the uh, New York uh, the uh, uh, Time Out article, and you can see you yeah. on stage. You know, and it's like film and music, and Most, you see us media, kind of doing yeah. the stuff live, yeah. and that's kind of where I come in. Yeah. What what uh, what's really interesting here as we wrap up is you have a really interesting journey, and it starts with travel. It starts mm. with experimenting with things. It starts, it continues with being curious. And like, look at all these things we've talked about. I mean, Cutter, this show, Mind on Heaven, it's all sort of comes back to Chattanooga in some it weird does. way. In a weird you way. Know? I cannot escape it. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you get back in the classroom. I can't wait. Yeah. This is something where I, you know, feel that 
when, you know, things are working in the classroom, you get that same energy of, you know, whether it's, you know, developing a show with someone or working on a film, you know, you're, you're in this group project, you mm-hmm. know, in a way that is uh, really, really, in, you know, enticing and revealing, both about yourself and about other people, how you work together. You think you work well, you know, and yet you find out how you have to adjust what you do, you know, so yeah. Cool. Here, I want to talk about some of your personal sure. work. I mean, you, you have made, in my opinion, and probably in your opinion too, you, you've made a significant change from Talk Soup, you know, and and those <laughs> those fun kind of, you know, cable TV shows that are on in the United States. I mean, you you did Desolation Angels, which was uh, uh, performed or read by Steppenwolf, and now you're working on the Mary Shelley stuff. Talk to me, uh, talk to us about your your personal work and what are some of your goals there, and what what do you see yourself doing? Sure. Um, yeah, like you say, back in the day, I was doing more sort of sketch comedy and sort of some more sort of just kind of fun, uh, sort of silly. Uh, uh, things like that but uh, although i enjoyed it a lot uh but yeah doing um uh, you know the desolation angels uh is a a a dramatic piece actually we have a stage reading of it that we're doing in bournemouth in april which will Mm. be nice um so i'm still kind of working on that i like doing theatrical stuff it was kind of a nice um something about theater is just you get right to the essence of what a story is um and uh, the uh, the Mary Shelley one you mentioned is called Shelley's Heart is my the new project that I've really been working on. It's nice because one of the things that um, uh, you can uh, it's being supported increasingly, especially in the UK, and I think it really comes out of Australia, is this idea of practice uh, based research or practice as research. Um, so it, you know. It, traditionally, the idea was if you want to be taken seriously as a researcher, you don't make things, but you analyze things that other people have made. Yeah. Um, now uh, there is a push for this idea of recognition of that the actual artifact that you've created can represent a legitimate research output. Uh, it's, it helps if you, uh, put together at least some sort of reflection on the process and can do things like identify, you know, why it's, it's a form of new knowledge, something new in the field. So in, in terms of Shelley's heart, this is something that I'm doing. It's not just my own personal project. It's actually, uh, part of my research, nice. uh, as yeah, part of my scholarship. So what what's happening is there's uh, this year 2018 is the 200th anniversary of uh, Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein, mm-hmm. and uh, in Bournemouth where I teach in Bournemouth Town Center there's a church called St Peter's Church and and there is the Shelley family tomb and Mary Shelley's buried there, along with the heart of her husband Percy <sighs> Shelley. Wow, which I always thought was kind of creepy and fascinating and I wanted to know more about it. Uh, and she's also her parents are there. Mary Godwin, who was like the first feminist, mm-hmm. William William Godwin, who was a you know really interesting radical philosopher of his day. So all of these people, there's this rich history, and of course they were hanging out with Lord Byron and John Keats. And so so I about two years ago I started cooking up this idea for a a location locative story or location aware story because I'd I'd heard about these things and. Basically, what that is is a, pl- a story where you go to a physical place, and as you walk around through the environment, little bits of narrative can be unlocked. So you're huh. you're looking on your phone, and it, you're looking at what looks like a little sat nav uh, map of the environment, and it indicates a place. And you walk over to that place, and you get close enough, you can unlock another piece of the story. And That's so the cool. way these, have, yeah, it's 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 a new way of sort yeah. of enjoy of of an in. You know, embedding the environment with some some narrative. Yeah, there are a lot of geolocated, you know, apps and things like that, which have some some stories. You know, you can have a treasure chest uh, find a, a you know a thing like that. But this, I like the story element, especially in the historical realm, as you're talking about. Yeah, and so I started thinking this would be an interesting educational tool. Teachers could take their students here on field trips, and they could explore the churchyard and follow this narrative that would also unlock facts about the real historical characters. So basically that's what I wrote up and I sort of made modern versions of Mary Shelley and the romantic poets, modern alter egos of them. And they're, uh, I 
put it together uh, and showed it to a, uh, a colleague of mine who actually runs a local theater company. He said, well, you could do this as a play, first of all, and that'd help you get actors together. Uh, so we did it as a staged reading a year ago in Bournemouth, and that went well. And based on that, we were able to get an actual stage debut, which was just last November. And we put it on the stage at the Shelley Theater, which is wow. <laughs> actually was used to be Shelley Manor. It was created by Mary Shelley's son. Wow. So, so um, that was exciting to do. And it was a multimedia thing. And so we shot a lot of stuff in the churchyard including somebody as a monster walking around in the churchyard, this actor, Steve Rollins, who did a great job. And so uh, with all those elements now, uh, I'm taking it the next step, which is to, to really flesh out and finish this location thing. We'll debut it in October. And there'll basically be four different paths based on the four different characters. So wow. you can follow Byron, who's based on Lord Byron, and he goes around to you know, that path follows around 13 places in the churchyard, or John, or Mary, or Percy's ghost. Wow. So, Wait, so do you have someone doing programming for it? I mean, on the back end? I mean, because it's uh, someone's got to, you know, make some decisions on, oh, am I following this person or that person? How are you doing the technology? Yes, I got very lucky in that regard. There's um, one of my colleagues, Charlie Hargood, uh, just started last spring. He came over from uh, University of Southampton. And he's created a web-based platform called Story Places, something that you can definitely worth checking out. Uh, they've already done a, a series of these. It's fairly new. It's open source. Um, they did one, for instance, last summer in Crystal Palace Park. And, the, and, and normally what they do is they'll have, uh, you know, a few different uh, – they'll have like one main writer and then maybe some students will write some additional narratives around these things. But so far, they've been fairly moderate in terms of their production. So if you if you go to that, you can you can experience it in demo mode. So if you wow. went to Story Places, you could go to the Crystal Palace one, and you could put in demo mode and navigate around and unlock little bits of story. But what you'll see are basic. It's text based with a few photographs, and the text tends to be either uh, you know just one narrator, narrator you know first mm -hmm. person often. So it's not scenes with characters interacting with each other. Whereas I think what, what'll be nice about this is it has interactive elements, it's got animations, yeah. it's got actual characters, you're embroiled in a dramatic situation. Is, is it, will it be on a phone or would it be, computer? how, how yes. do we see it? <laughs> it's on your phone. Uh -huh. So uh, people will go to the churchyard and, and uh, walk around with their phones on at the Story Places uh, cool. site and move from place to place and unlock little bits of it. So one one more thing, we sure. haven't talked about it. Um, I always believe, and I think you know this, that, that to be a good teacher in the arts, you also have to be a practitioner, mm -hmm. right? You have to right. be working and doing it. Right. And you were making a film. Yes. Or have been making a film for quite some time. Many years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us about the film and, and, and what's, you know, it's about teaching. Right. It's about teachers. It's not about teaching. It's about teachers. Right. It's and, called, okay, go ahead. No. It's called The Public School Wars, and um, it is the story of uh, the evolution and the... Uh, kind of the efforts to reform public education in the United States. And um, there are many competing interests, um, one of which is kind of the traditional school system. Um, and then there are, uh, for example, charter schools that are um, kind of a quasi, they, they call themselves public, but there's uh, private elements to it. And um, there's been um, a, a lot of contentious debate about that. And um, there are just so many aspects to this. That's just one small part of it. But what I found is there's so many aspects to the public school wars that it's – and it's such a huge project. It, that has been one of the big challenges is, hmm. you know, what is the story that it you're telling? It is huge, yeah. Yeah. And so ultimately I think for me it's going to end up being an overview of the issues that are out there along with some stories of people that are fighting the battles mm -hmm. on the front lines. Um, and hopefully it will hold some interest. Yeah, uh, I, some I saw it, it does hold yeah. interest. It's an important issue. Yeah, and uh, but as you know, when you've seen your footage for so long, over so <laughs> many years, it's like, um, you know, you go through these cycles and of uh, loving it and thinking it's the best and uh, being sick of it. And that's actually one of the things we teach our students all the time. It feels normal to hate doing the work on this and it feels normal to be really excited about it and you will go through that multiple times yep. on 
most projects. Well, you know, I saw a cut and I really liked it. I mean, you know my feedback on it. Right. You know? What? What? Uh, when might it be done? Well, I'm I'm <laughs> What's really left? hoping uh, sometime in March. I mean, it really. Uh, I just did an inter- one last interview last week. I've got two more that I feel like I need to do to fill out one of the stories about the uh, diet hunger strike that mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. Um, in uh, 2015, I believe it was, uh, the Saving uh, Diet High School. Um, and, um, so I'll do a couple more interviews on that. Um, and, um, but then, you know, you've got to do the, uh, the audio mixing and the, and I'm taking to heart your, uh, suggestion that we do a narration of some, uh-huh. uh, sort. So I'm working on that as well. So pick a, pick a date and it'd be done by graduation. Yes, or <laughs> exactly. So, um, and uh, it helps in some ways to be a perfectionist, and it hurts in other ways. Sure. So, um, you know, to have a certain high standard. And also, the other tough thing is this is a, you know, in one aspect of it, it's a traditional 90 minute documentary. And that is, in many ways, not a form that, uh, although it's more popular than ever, um, one of the problems that Mark Marin said, enough with documentaries already, you know, we've got <laughs> enough. Um, it's, it's a, you know, there's so many different forms now and, and lengths, you know, to get, ask somebody to spend 90 minutes yeah. on a subject. I really want to make it, you know, worth their while. So, well, I'm sure you will. And, mm. and, you know, you know, I say this and reset it at the start and mm. I wrapping it up like yeah. a professional. There you go. Does, uh, you know, Stick the, that th- landing. <laughs> yeah. the thousand true fans, yeah. you know, there are clearly enough people that really care about the issues in education today. That, you know, you tell a lot of interesting stories. You're all over the country. You're in California. You're in D.C. You're in New York. You're in Chicago. Seattle. Yeah. And, and, and you know, people will be interested. And I think if you build on the thousand true fans you have and then build from there, you're going to find an audience for sure. I mean, it may be an, a, an untraditional distribution method. I mean, it may be film festivals. It may be PBS. But it could be websites. It could be streaming. It sure. could be – I think it does, would do great at, you know, one-off screenings with you in person at various places. Right, right. You know? Um, and it's it's really nice. And one of the, the best uh, things that I've discovered during this is there are so many teachers that care so much about – Teaching. Kids out there, yeah, yeah. yeah, and 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 they, I mean, almost to a fault, will uh, devote energy and time uh, to help students, and um, you know more so than you know. I mean, it's just more so than I think I could, yeah. you know, if I was teaching elementary school. Jeez. So there's there's how do you do that? I, I, there are so many heroes. Well, <laughs> like six year olds. <laughs> my my sister in law has been teaching, I think, close to thirty years now in Chicago public schools. She's hey. teaching first grade now, and she said you have to teach them how to write and uh, uh, wipe their nose at the same time, you know, <laughs> teach them to do math and tie their shoes at the same time. Um, and so that's, that's uh, there's a lot of heroic people out there doing that work. And they're, and they're under a lot of pressure from a lot of different interests. And it's, uh, it's fascinating to see the, uh, the, the, the way they're fighting back. That, that's, that's, you're right on. And mm-hmm. I think that's a great place to end. I mean, you know, I mean, my image now is uh, teaching them to write and wipe their nose at the same time. But, you know, I'm glad we don't have to do that. But I'm glad you're making this film. And thank you for coming over here and talking to me. And, uh, you know, hopefully we didn't stink too bad. No, no. Can I add one last thing? Please. Some of the best advice I ever got in teaching uh-huh. was from somebody I used to work with that's sitting across the table <laughs> from me right now. And you said, don't fuck up. And, <laughs> and what I loved about that was... In three words, that was three words, right? In uh-huh. three words, you said, I trust you. I uh, trust that you're going to do a good job. And if you don't, uh, I'll probably have your back, but there's going to be consequences. <laughs> and I, I think that's fantastic advice uh, succinctly stated. So so thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, it changed the name of this thing to Don't Fuck Up. I, <laughs> You can have it for free. I, yes. You know what? I'm telling you, that's the, I've told students forever and ever and ever, there's one bit of advice I'm going to give a film student is that. Because right. if you don't fuck up, you're going to be pro- totally fine. Right. Remember Chelsea Morin, the student Chelsea sure, Morin? Yeah. Sure. So I told her that and she laughed. I said, no, I'm serious. And she said, are you serious? I said, yeah, I'm serious. And she, I said, it's a perfect rule. Right. And so we were the group of people one time and I said, just turned to her and said, Chelsea, what's my rule of... Uh, of, t- of filmmaking and she just looks real sheep and he goes don't fuck up <laughs> I said yes yeah. <laughs> yeah, right yeah. Yeah. yes so yes thank you that's a good rule for teachers too. there you go okay that's it that's the show thank you all for taking a listen uh, just a quick update on all of these guys 
Uh, first up, that was Brian Cagle who was talking about his projects, and, and Brian and I talked uh, earlier today, and he said he's just started a film production company called Constituent Films with his old friend Gabe Klinger, whose film Porto comes out on Netflix next next week. They want to create work that highlights and advocates and promotes social change at the community level, and they're working with groups around the city doing just that. So good luck to Brian. Brad Giori in Bournemouth, England, is full speed ahead with his project that's going to be ready to go in October. And Bill Bacon and I uh, traded texts this morning, and, and he shot a few more interviews. And, and the joke is he's almost done with the film. Bill, I'm sorry. I love you. You know that. And that, um, as I said, the film will be released. His film about uh, the public school wars will be released around Christmas time. But anyway, thank you all for uh, listening. Thank you all for being guests uh, on the show beforehand. And it is time for me to get a drink. Get a drink.